so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. Then they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Why do you test me? Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. But they could not catch him in his words, in the presence of the people, and they marveled at his answer and kept silent. Well, good evening. Uh, it's good to see you all. Good to be with you. Thanks for your kind invitation for me to come and be with you this evening. And uh, we turn our thoughts to Luke's Gospel as uh, Chris read for us in chapter 20 and verse 20 to 26. And I want us to consider together this evening, render to God. Uh, I don't know whether you are uh, an experienced chess player this evening, whether you like playing chess and whether you um, can beat the people around you. I'm privileged to play a bit of chess with one of, uh, one of our congregation this evening and uh, he's taught me some lessons on this. Uh, the game of chess and um, diplomacy are sort of famously linked, it seems. Diplomacy on an, on an international scale because strategic thinking are, are, are useful on the chessboard just as much as in international affairs. Um, it's using skill like that instead of giving in to chance and mere hope is the idea, isn't it? You move this way, you say these things, and I'll move this way and I'll say these things. And you take the long view and you hope that in giving a little here and giving a little there, you might in the end win the day. Uh, move too quickly, I think, seems to be a skill. Move too quickly, as you might be tempted to do, to go in uh, for, uh, uh, for the win. And you could lose it all. You play games like this. And we can be a little bit like that with our relationship with God. We think we can play games with him. We think we can give a little here and give a little there and say our yeses and say uh, our agreements here and there with respect to his word uh, with an end in mind that we think we will win and we will get our way. We're happy to take losses perhaps. We're happy to give a little here give up a little bit of time with our, our lives, a little bit of money maybe, so long as in the end we'll, we'll get what we want. And this is a problem because we can begin to see that everyone around us, including God himself, is an opponent in the game of life. And all that matters is that I get what I want. I want you to see then this evening that it appears that the scribes and the Pharisees had that sort of approach to the Lord Jesus Christ. They thought they could play games with him. They thought they could question him and trap him and get him to do uh, certain things and say certain things so that they could get their own way. You see that with the conundrums that are posed at the beginning of the chapter of chapter 20, uh, a conundrum was posed about baptism and the chief, prime, chief priests and the scribes calculated that they, in the end, well, they, they couldn't speak the truth. That's sort of what their, their answer was. But here, 
I want you to see that the Lord Jesus, in complete contrast to the scribes and the Pharisees and the way they operated with things, the Lord Jesus doesn't evade. He doesn't give in to win the crowds. He just simply speaks the truth. And you and I must do the same when we're approaching God and when we're approaching his judgment. We need to simply speak the truth. We need to confess our sins. We need to realise that his word is truth and we must agree with it. We must bend to his word. So are you being honest? Are you being truthful or are you just playing games with God? Are you playing a ch- game of chess? Well, uh, look, at, look at the question, firstly, that the scribes and the Pharisees pose they, uh, well, they send their spies, don't they? Um, those listening into the questioning of Jesus, initially, verse 21, would have been very impressed, wouldn't they, see? Well, this is high praise indeed that they give to the Lord Jesus, teacher, a great, obviously a great uh, title of respect, teacher. We know that you speak and teach rightly, and show no partiality, but teach, truly teach the way of God. That's incredible, isn't it? If you were to hear someone speaking like that today about the Lord Jesus Christ, you'd be very impressed, wouldn't you? Uh, surely these are religious people who we, we should pay attention to, uh, who should be trusted with such high and lofty words, religious words of deep respect, very impressive indeed. But Psalm 55 verse 21 says, His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. We need that sort of wisdom, don't we, and discernment when we're listening to religious words on the radio, on the television, when we're meeting religious people around us. They can use high and lofty words, but what's going on in their hearts? We meet people like this, don't we? And it it can be quite distressing to learn someone we thought was so wise and so Christian. Well, they're actually living a double life. They're using all of the words, all of the terminology, but what deep down in their hearts, they're, they're far from Jesus. They're simply in it for some gain for themselves. They're playing games, like the game of chess. They're playing games with men with the congregation before them all. They're playing games with God himself. They think they can get away with it. And this is perhaps why true Christians should be understanding if they, uh, if, for example, it's just a little lesson, if they don't immediately get given positions in churches when they first volunteer for service. Uh, true servanthood and service comes from a patient heart that understands much discernment is needed for churches to honour the word of God. And church leadership needs wisdom in this. It's not just people who use the right words who we need to listen to. Uh, saying plausible things. Those who come saying plausible things, in fact, are to be treated with equal discernment as those who perhaps, perhaps initially say foolish things. Uh, the words don't come out right. We need wisdom. So they ask anyway this very difficult question. And it's a very dis- difficult question. It's a serious one. And it's one that we need to think about a little bit this evening. About rendering taxes or tribute to Caesar. But we know that even though this question might be very interesting for us this evening. We know that their motive was simply to trap Jesus in their snare. An interesting and uh, deep conundrum, really. But look at the answer of our Saviour here uh, to these scribes and Pharisees as they send their spies. They're sort of shallow, aren't they? They can't face him themselves. He perceived their craftiness and said to them, show me 
a denarius. There's wonderful wisdom of our Saviour as always in his word, isn't it? Let me just start by saying what our Saviour does not say. What he does not say. He does not say, and this would be helpful for us, he does not say it is not lawful to pay tribute to Caesar. He doesn't say that. Um, this being a worldly government of sorts, um, uh, the, the, the Roman Empire around that was dominating the, uh, the political uh, horizon and everything that was going on, um, a worldly government. Some uh, think of, of that perhaps in some ways in regards to our British government, that we, we shouldn't have anything to do with them. Um, but our Saviour doesn't say it's not lawful to pay tributes to Caesar. It's not lawful to pay taxes. It's not lawful to, uh, to have dealings with the government. No, Jesus doesn't say that. Why? Well, God uses at times, we know in Scripture, worldly governments to achieve his purposes, uh, such as the Babylonian Empire, uh, famously so. They were an evil people. God, God does not condone their actions at all. In fact, they are condemned in the most clearest terms. But God used them and called for them to turn to him. And he used them to refine and rebuke his own people, in fact. Even worldly governments with no appreciation for God, the gospel, the church, can be a means, nevertheless, can't it, of restraining evil, of holding back the evil that men and women would do and can be a means of doing some good. They can, in a strange way at times, be a means of propagating the gospel and sometimes in hilarious ways, such as the imprisonment, I was thinking of the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul um, and in, in Galatians 1. Uh, the apostle speaks there, doesn't he, of his, how his imprisonment has actually been the means of the furtherance of the gospel through, you know, firstly through, the, uh, through the, the soldiers and so on. And the gospel went further, even though they tried to chain the gospel, yet uh, the government tried to chain the gospel, yet the gospel went forth in mighty power to his praise and glory. Or uh, take the example of Daniel, who didn't reject everything that the Babylonian Empire had imposed on him. There were lines, for sure, where he said, no, enough's enough. And we'll be speaking about that in a moment. But much of what they asked, he accepted. And nowhere in Scripture is that condemned. And, um, and we see, see then these, these things. Neither does the Lord Jesus Christ say, it is lawful to pay tribute to Caesar. He doesn't just simply answer like that, does he? Um, uh, I'm, um, uh, I want you to marvel at the wisdom of the Lord Jesus as the people do at the end of verse 26 this evening, but, uh, uh, but it's so helpful for us to realise these things. He, do, he doesn't say it's, it's lawful to pay tribute to Caesar either. He, he would have he would have then, if he had said that simply like that, then he would have denounced to the people as careless about the Jewish nation. Uh, it would have looked like he was careless about the Jewish people and their plight. Now, a third option I want you to think about is the answer that we often give, I think, in, in our modern evangelical circles, is that, well, we, we simply sort of throw our hands up in the air and we say, it's impossible. It's impossible to answer such a, a tricky and difficult question. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? Impossible to answer. We throw our hands up. Some Christians approach theology like this with a sort of shallow uh, dismissal of tricky and difficult theological issues and practical issues about how we are to live in this very complex and difficult age, it seems. Christian, Christianity, it said, well, it should just be a simple thing, easy. Let's just all agree to disagree. Stop asking difficult questions. Stop arguing. 
Stop making your distinctions, you awkward Reformed Baptists, we're often told. We don't know. Just admit it. Throw your hands up in the air. Take, for example, the the matter of deepest importance, which is the matter of the doctrine of the Trinity. Oh, well, let's just all agree to disagree. It's a very difficult question. But there is much in Scripture to tell us about the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. And we're responsible to declare the truth as difficult and challenging as it may be. And we need to know God and we need, we need to know something about him and God has revealed himself to us in Scripture after all. Jesus doesn't respond with such a shallow attitude, does he? He doesn't just throw his hands up in the air and say, oh, that question is too tricky for me. <laughs> Another uh, uh, way that we seem to approach things today is to say, oh, there's no answer. There isn't an answer sort of agnostic approach to things, isn't it? There's no answer to these things. Nobody knows. Nobody could possibly know. And if you meet someone who says they think they know something, be suspicious of them. That's the agnostic, isn't it? Uh, These days, the, the spirit of the ages, well, there isn't an answer. Forget about it. Just be happy. Forget about tricky questions. Forget about your eternal destiny. Forget about who is God. Forget about whether the Bible is the word of God or not. Forget about how we get right with God. Forget about sin. Just forget about it all. It's too tricky. There's no answer. Just be happy, will you? Thankfully, though, thankfully the word of God doesn't come to us like that, does it? Thankfully, our Saviour doesn't deal with this particular question nor any other in any of those ways. Our Saviour, in response, not only convinces us that he is the most wise counsellor that has ever been, but he also gives us aid of our living in this earth. We're not on our own, are we? Dear brothers and sisters, we're not on our own. We don't have to make it up today. It's a, yes, we're in the 21st century, but we have the word of God with us. It's given us everything that we need to live effectively in this, our generation, and to preach the word of God effectively in this, our generation, with the aid of the Holy Spirit, and as we seek him in prayer. It's hard, yes, answering difficult questions, but God is with us, and he will help us. Well, no, that's kind of quite, quite a lot of negative stuff, I suppose, isn't it? But, but what do we learn then from, from this? What is our Saviour saying? Well, firstly, we are to render. Just think about that word, render, uh, there. Give. Uh, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God. Render to God then the things that are God's. What does render mean? Render means to give back, give back something that is owed, give back. Christians, the gospel teaches us that everything that we have, everything that we have, you understand that? Have you allowed that to seep into your thinking, into your heart, into your whole being, that everything, everything, everything I have is a gift? Everything I have my family, my clothes, my church, my pastor, my my brothers and sisters, the food on my table, the job I have, the bank balance I have, the car I've just purchased. Everything is a gift. Everything is a gift. Some people think, don't they, uh, that they have the things in life that they have, Life, goodness, family, why have they got it? Maybe this is the first thing. It's because I've worked hard. I've worked hard to be where I'm at today. I've worked hard. And workers deserve good things. I'm a worker, so I deserve it. I've got nothing to give back, therefore... 
You do your time of work, then you get goodness back to you. Do you think like that? You're wrong. Everything that you have is a gift from God. Everything that you have is a gift from God. Others think that good things should come to them simply because they exist. I exist. I deserve everything because I'm human. Well, certainly you do deserve dignity because you have been made in the image of God, but you are owed nothing whatsoever by God. Nothing. You're not owed anything. I'm not owed anything at all. Because I've, I haven't lived in accordance with, with God, who is the giver of all things. I haven't lived my life in line with him. I haven't listened to his voice. I haven't sought him. I haven't given thanks to him. I haven't obeyed him. I don't deserve anything at all. He doesn't owe me anything whatsoever. He doesn't owe me anything. God does not owe me anything. This life doesn't owe me anything at all. Dear friends, allow that to sink in. Christian thinking says that everything that we have, the gospel teaches us that everything we have is a gift. Life is a gift. It's a precious one. The Bible teaches us that every person around us is precious too, but it's a gift. And so we sing, don't we? Oh, the love that wilt not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I then give thee back the life I owe. Everything. I, I, I give it back. I render to God. So that's where we need to start, isn't it? with render. Everything that I have is a gift. And so our Saviour says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That's the first thing that he says. Um, They were happy, weren't they, to use the services that that they were were beneficiaries of of the government. They were happy for that, Um, whatever form it was. Money is good. And it's to be used between humans to other humans. It can be used for so much good, can't it? Money can be used. There it is. There's the there's there's the denarii there, and it's uh, it's useful. It could be a a means of great good, couldn't it? Um, Of course, it's the love of money, the love of the denarii, that is a a root of all kinds of evil. and Christians need to regularly check their motives. We need to prayerfully think about how we use our money. Um, people who talk the most about the evils of money can be quite happy to receive it, can't they? <laughs> it's good to obey this authority in all temporal things. So we learn from this that God is not only interested in our relationship directly with himself, vertically, with, uh, with himself, but he's interested, he's part of, and we need to seek his faith in, face in our dealings with one another, in our relationships with one another. That's what we learn here uh, as a principle. Over half of the commandments, after all, are in respect to our dealings with each other, aren't they? Uh, yeah, on a horizontal, how we interact with one another. Who is given the authority to persecute? Or to prosecute, rather. I suppose it's part of persecute. Who's, no, sorry, that's a completely wrong word. Who is given the authority to prosecute in the New Testament? Well, it's the government. It's the government, and it's to be recognised as a, as, a, as a gift from God. But we also learn that God isn't only interested in our relationship then within the church, in, uh, in, in, in our, within Christian circles and how we, and he is, with how we treat one another. That's the first thing, isn't it? How you love the brethren is the first thing. But he's also interested in how we relate to 
everyone around us. Everyone. You can't treat uh, the unbeliever badly. There's no excuse for it. And treat the Christian well. No, the, the Bible doesn't recognise that at all. It's a, you know, it's a requirement of the elder after, world, after all in uh, the pastoral epistles that we, uh, that, um, that we be thought well of outsiders, it says. So it's, it's about our relationship with the world around us. So let's be good examples of, of that. Now, we are, to, we are to render then to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But then secondly, they are to render to God the things that are God's. We are to render to God the things that are God's. Here to render what? We owe him everything. We owe him everything. I give thee back the life I owe. He is worthy, is he not, of all praise because he is God, because he is the only one. He is the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who has ever been, who is, and who forever will be, who created all things out of nothing. He gifted it with life, and he created. But even if he did not create, if you like, he's still worthy of all praise. We give him all praise. We worship him for who he is. That's before we even begin to think of what he has done. He deserves all praise. He's worthy of everything. He is wonderful then. Secondly, he's wonderful. And all of his ways, every word that has ever been revealed, every truth that has come, proceeded from his being, sort of as it were, before we've got this great book, is wonderful. Everything about him is wonderful. He is holy. He's perfect. He's righteous. He is light. There is no darkness in him whatsoever, no shadow of turning. Every word he speaks is truth. His yes is yes. His no is no. Everything he does is wonderful. Well, everything about him is wonderful. Then everything he does is wonderful. His word is true. His word is true, and so it must be obeyed. You don't get the option. You don't get to argue. You don't get to play chess with God. Well, you've done that, but I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get my... You don't get to do that with God. He is God. You don't get to argue with him. If he says, give me your life, you give him your life. You don't get to argue. We're like that, aren't we, as a people? Oh, yeah, I hear this from certain people around me. Yeah, but. (laughs) Yeah, I'll do that. It's the chess thing. I'll do that, but. Let me do that. No, you don't get to, yeah, but God. His word is true and it must be obeyed. And he created you. I was just leading up to that, see. He created you. He created you. He's your creator. Do we not owe him all things? Yeah, we're a people, it seems, who think that they, we can take from him. Give it to me. Give me life. I'll take it. I'll cut it off if it's an inconvenience. I'll cut it off if I think so. That's the way we're approaching life today, isn't it, dear friends? He created us. Do we not owe him all things? He, he gave us his son. He gave us his son. He gave, he, not only is he deserving of all praise and glory and wonder and your life because of who he is, but not only that, he has given us all things. He's given us Jesus Christ, his only beloved son. And he died on a cross so that he can purchase you, so that he can have you, dear Christian, to be his forever and ever. He gave you his son, so we must 
mustn't we give him our lives? And we must do this daily. Render to God the things that are God's. And let's just try and bring that, those two things together, please. Render to Caesar. Render to God. Those are the two things we've, we've just briefly thought about there. The two are possible. I want to say that to you this evening. The two are possible. Rome, Caesar, and the British government don't really hinder us from doing both things, do they? Today, and nor did they then. We can give all our lives to the Lord today, and we can live sensible existences amongst in this world we can do it we can do it with his help of course the current government have not made it at all difficult for us for doing that don't use whatever government we have as an excuse for you not giving your life to god is what i'm saying we have no excuse the issue is our own sinful hearts, isn't it? It's not the Labour government or the Conservative government that is stopping me from giving my all to God. They're not. I can't excuse my sin and my rebelliousness because of that. It is possible. It's, impo- it's possible for us to serve God fully today. And to serve our communities and our families and to stop being so selfish. You've just got to stop it. I'm not going to try to compare the past with today, but what I know is that God has called us to worship him now and to serve our friends. And he calls us to do that today. Render to Caesar, render to God. Give your life to him. Um, So just a couple of applications then. We we waste so much time and energy, see, don't we? Excusing ourselves, playing this game of chess, saying, well, yeah, I can do that, but I can't do that. We're in this one foot in, one foot out mentality. We waste so much time and energy arguing whether it's right or wrong to care for others, whether it's right to give up our hobbies for Sunday worship. Nobody's stopping you from coming here this evening. The government isn't stopping you from worshipping God morning and evening on a Sunday. The government isn't stopping you from sharing the gospel in the streets as, as you can in the workplace in the right way, it's not really stopping you from sharing the gospel with your friends, with your neighbours, it's not. We argue whether it's right to go to the prayer meeting or spend time with our friends, whether it's right to go to church when we're feeling tired or not, whether it's right to share the gospel with our friends, as I said, whether it's right to obey the rules of our governments when they're difficult, whether it's right for us to give answers to the legal authorities when they suspect us of committing crimes. Just give them answers. Churches need to do that, I think. Whether we should give money to the government or the church, when this will mean that we might not be able to eat out quite so many times and get so many takeaways. We question that. And oh, all of that chaff be blown away by the wisdom of Christ's words to us this evening. We need to obey. We need to render to Caesar the things of the Caesars. We need to render to God the things that are God's. Give your life to the Lord. Now, I'm, we're not unaware of real persecution, don't get me wrong, and the dangers, the real dangers that are poses the church today in the United Kingdom. We're not unaware of that. The imposition of its worldview on us and its godly, godless philosophy is a great danger, and we will oppose it. Of course we will. We will oppose it. 
when at all necessary. We will write if we can, lobby if we can, I suppose. Um, we will seek to maintain freedom of speech, but we will preach the gospel whether we are persecuted or not. Of course we will. But right now I'm saying to you, we're not being stopped from doing that. I'm not unaware, we're not unaware either that some seeking to please Caesar too much have foolishly and wrongly fallen into sin. And it's foolish. Churches promoting a godless agenda, the LGBT Q plus agenda in the name of Christianity. When those two worldviews actually just do not correlate, they don't come together. And it's foolish. Churches, you turn to their websites, and that's the thing you see on the first page. Dancing to the world's tune. And it's not necessary, it's foolish. And it's sinful, (laughs) basically. (laughs) We are to render to God the things that are God's. So I don't think that any of this means that we need to dance to, the, to a godless tune. Not at all. Far be it. And then last bit of application, I suppose. Many of you might be worried about how to answer difficult questions. Uh, well, we can study, we can prepare, we can pray for wisdom. But we can answer, we can speak. The word of God, that's what I want to maintain. Sometimes we need wisdom, realising that this person isn't listening to our answers and they're just trying to entangle us in their words. We need wisdom for that, don't we? And sometimes we don't know the answers, but that's okay. It's all right not to know answers to everything. So I'm not saying that. So here is a difficult question. Uh, uh, Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar? or not? A challenging question. One that might make us scratch our heads, but our Saviour answers in wonderful divine wisdom, doesn't he? And it teaches us that we're living in this difficult and challenging age, and our priority needs to be the Word of God and to render to him the things that are his, to put him first in our lives. And to speak his word into this crooked and depraved generation. Life isn't a game of chess where you have to win though. Where you have to get your own way with the Lord. The gospel says Jesus wins. He's won. He's going to win. All things are his. There's no arguing with him. Our job is to submit our lives to him and his word and we will be more than conquerors with him. Give your life to him. He's given you everything that you have. It's a gift. Give him back the life you owe. Render your life to him. Give him back all that you have. Amen.